This has been the substitution rule for indefinite integrals. Indefinite integrals where we don't specify any lower and upper bounds and that our answers are gonna look like some function plus c. But we can do the same kind of thing when it comes to definite integrals. So what I want to consider here is the integral from a to b of the same kind of integrand, f of g times g prime. And I want to figure out what can I do in that scenario. Well, first of all, it's the same basic idea that we had before, the antiderivative of f, the capital F, at g, but evaluated between a and b. And these bars mean I'm going to plug in b and I'm going to subtract off plugging in a. So in other words, this just looks like f of g of b minus f of g of a. However, I can manipulate this. I know what, what this is. I can write it in terms of u in the following way. This is going to be the definite integral between g of a and g of b, where I take the little f evaluated at u du. In other words, when I think about it in terms of this way, we're, we're using our sort of variable of integration as this u. When I think of it originally, the variable of integration is going to be x. And that when you change these formats, you also have to change the limits of integration. This says x equals a to x equal to b. But down here, this says u equals g of a up to u equals g of b. And that should make sense since u was defined to be g of x when x was a then u should be g of a. So now we have this nice formula, let's put it all together. We have that the definite integral from a to b of functions of this form are the integral from g of a to g of b of f of u du. So how does this work out in an example? Let's take uh, the integral from zero to one of the square root of one plus three x dx. So the first thing is, we've got to figure out what's our u and what's gonna be our function. So I think that our u here is this part underneath the square root. We always can sort of have a bit of a hint at this because we can think f of g of x is a composition. And here I have a composition as well, square root of one plus three x. So I'm gonna set that to be my u. Now that I've identified the u, I want to go to, how about the, the g of a and the g of b? Well, u equals g of x is equal to one plus three x. So if I plug in zero here, then what I'm gonna get is just one plus zero, so g of zero is one. And if I plug in the one for my x, I get one plus three, which is equal to four. So that's what my bounds are gonna be. They're going between now one and four. And then I have to think about what's my du. The derivative of my g, the derivative of my one plus three x is three. So my du should be three dx. Now, the only problem is there's not actually a three on the outside. So I'm going to, I want there to be a three on the outside. I'm gonna do that same trick. I'm gonna multiply the top and multiply the bottom by three. And what this is gonna give me is gonna give me one third and then the three dx combines into being a du. So it's one third du, square root of u, we know that part, and the one and four is what the zero and one have changed to when I've exchanged it from expressing in terms of x to expressing it in terms of u. And now this is an integral that we know how to do. This is just gonna be some power, we can compute that. This is u to the one half. u to the one half's antiderivative is u to the three halves times two thirds. And so what I'm going to therefore get is the, the one third comes all the way out the front, and then the u to the one half becomes this two thirds u to the three halves, and I'm evaluating it between one and four. By the way, since taking derivatives is usually a little bit easier for us at the beginning, it's always good to do this quick check. Uh, if I take the derivative of u to the three halves, it would be the three halves comes out the front, cancels with the two thirds, and goes to u to the three halves minus one, which is the square root. So if you ever sort of forget these formulas, take what you're guessing and take its derivative and verify that it really isn't any derivative. Nonetheless, the final step that is remaining for us is to evaluate the four and the one, so I'm just gonna plug them in. I can say this is the one third times the two thirds is the two ninths, so I get my two ninths here. And then it's just the four to the three halves minus the one to the three halves. I can say four to the three halves is like two cubed, which is two, four, eight, eight minus one is seven. And so I get in the end, 14 ninths.